This morning, we start a brand new series called Keys to Freedom. And uh, Keys to Freedom is basically a study of the Ten Commandments and looking at them in perhaps a different light than a lot of us think of them as because, uh, as I mentioned with the kids, we think of the Ten Commandments as being restrictive. We think of them as being um, harsh and intolerant. And hopefully by the end of this series, we'll find something uh, completely different about them starting with this morning. Um, before we do that, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine. This guy's name is Johnny. At least at this point, this guy's name is Johnny. Some of you may know that we lost our golden retriever a couple of years ago. And even though I'm the kind of guy that could have gone out the next day to get another dog, I have three girls that disagree with me. And so it was really, really hard for them to get over this, this dog that grew up with them throughout their entire life, and I get that. I'm not making fun of it at all. We finally decided it's time to get a new dog. And I say this is, uh, this is Johnny, his name may change, because um, if you've ever tried to adopt a dog from a rescue organization, it is amazing. You have to jump through all of these hoops. Johnny may be ours. We have to go through a home inspection to find out if we're safe. We had to pay a fee for him. Um, I have to go through dog training obedience classes. The lady that I've been working with, I don't think really understood my sense of humor, which is, some of you understand well, because some of you don't understand my sense of humor. But uh, she wrote and she said, here's the things you need to do. We need to do a home inspection. We need to do this. We need to do that. You need to be willing to take obedience classes to train the dog. And I wrote back to her and I said, you know, I'm 63 years old, which has changed now, but anyway, I was, I'm 63 years old and I have had several dogs in my life. I have trained them all. They've all done very well. I really don't see a need for me to go through obedience classes to train this dog. And she wrote back and said, basically, well, the dog training class is mandatory. If you want a dog from us, you have to go through the dog training classes. Even our own staff members have to go through dog training classes before they can adopt a dog from us. Here's where I probably stepped over the line a little bit. I wrote back and said, you know what? I'll do the dog training classes, but let me just say that I wish hospitals had the same rules for children being brought home from the hospital because I know a lot of kids that should have had not dog training classes. Let me rephrase this. I know a lot of parents that need to have child training classes. Maybe hospitals should pick up on your idea. She didn't respond to that. So I'm thinking maybe I might have overstepped the bonds a little bit or the lines a little bit. But anyway, so this is Johnny. So we're kind of hoping that uh, we'll be able to jump through all the rules and all the hoops to get this puppy. Isn't it amazing? Uh, you, know, and you can kind of see why people get tired of the rules. You know, rules are binding, and, and we sometimes just feel so weighted down by them. When you're on your way to work, and you're late, isn't 55 miles an hour rather unreasonable? I mean, shouldn't they just have a little sign, you know, speed limit 55, and then in parentheses, unless you're late, in which case, anything you consider reasonable? You know, because you're late, you've got to get there. You know? And yet, rules are important, aren't they? Um, some of you may know that I, especially in the last few years, have had a, a tremendous, tremendous burden for people that struggle with addictions. Um, it's so rampant, especially in our area. Um, for some of you may not know that this particular part of the country, and especially this part of the state, uh, has some of the highest addiction rate in the entire country. And, and it's people that, for whatever the reason, can't fit into the rules. And uh, this last week, um, I got a text from a friend of mine. I go to a Bible study on Friday mornings with a couple of other guys. And um, for the last, man, last couple of years anyway, we've been praying for a girl uh, who happens to be the girlfriend of one of the guys, the son, girlfriend of the son of the guy that was in the Bible study. So it's Greg's son's girlfriend. And... Um, she and the son have been struggling with alcoholism uh, for the last, like I say, several years. The son has a couple of times tried to step out of that and try to uh, get away from that. It's been hard, but he's been making some progress. 
The girlfriend, on the other hand, has been in and out of um, treatment programs, in and out of the hospital. Uh, finally, um, they told her, they said, this is your last shot. The county said, if you can't get this together, we can't help you anymore. She died Sunday, 30-some years old, died of alcoholism. A dad is out of the picture for her little girl that's eight years old. She couldn't fit in to the rules that we set up for people. And it took her life. And I don't know why necessarily, because I've never met her, but that was really hard for me. It was really hard for me to think about this life that's tried so hard to fit into the rules and could not do it. There's a lot of times when we think of the Ten Commandments kind of that way. We think of them as being restrictive and we think that they're just too hard to keep. But let me remind you of something, and that is that freedom isn't about being free, but freedom isn't the ability to do what you want. Freedom is the ability to do what you were made for. Think about that. We all want freedom, and what I'm hoping to show you, as I said earlier in our, our series on the Ten Commandments, is to bring us a full circle from what we usually think about the Ten Commandments to realize that the Ten Commandments aren't restrictive. The Ten Commandments are freeing. Let me give you an example of that. Let's just say that you're my two-year-old child, and we have this beautiful yard. Right next to it is a major highway. And so because I love you, I put up a fence in the yard. Now you can look at that fence one of two ways. You can think of it as being intolerant. You can think of it as being restrictive. Who are you? If you're my father and you love me, why would you put a fence up to keep me from going where I want to go and doing what I want to do? Why did you put this up to keep me bound in when I've got a free spirit that wants to fly and I can't do it because you're trapping me within these confines? You could look at it that way. Or you could look at it and say, wow, there's a lot of cars out there. There's a lot of bad stuff out there. My dad must love me. Because look what he did. <laughs> look what he did. He built a fence for me. One of the things we found out with Johnny uh, is that we've got to make sure that we have him safe. Some, uh, we've read, I read some reviews of the place, and there were some people that were required, if they were going to get their dog, to put a chain link fence up in their yard because they wanted to make sure that puppy was safe. Again, they want more safety for a dog than some of us want for our kids. But we look at that and we think of God as being that kind of person where he wants to keep us hemmed in and that's not what it's all about at all. What I hope that you see today and as we go through this study is that he's a God of love and he's a dad and the things that he brings into your life and the things that he keeps in your life aren't because he's being intolerant, aren't because he's being restrictive and mean, but because he loves you and he wants you to be the very, very best that you could be. So this morning we're going to, as I said, start with the Ten Commandments. I'd like to ask you to stand together as we read God's Word together. And what I'm going to be doing over the next couple of weeks, I'll just kind of forewarn you about this, is that uh, we're going to read this same passage over and over again for the next ten weeks. But we're going to do it in different versions of the Bible because sometimes that will help us to get a little bit different viewpoint of things. This morning I'll be reading from the one that we're the most familiar with, which is the New International Version. And I'll be reading Exodus chapter 20, verses um, 2 through 17, which is page 118 in your pew Bible if you want to follow along. Exodus 22 through 17. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God punishing the children of for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but allowing, showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord your God will hold on your daughter, your male or female servants, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. 
Honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servants, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I pray now that as we come to this time of the service, when we look into your word, uh, I just ask that, first of all, the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth would be pleasing and satisfying to you. But also, Father, maybe more importantly, that they would be an encouragement to us as we go out into the world that's around us. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. In order to really get a grasp of the Ten Commandments and what all that means, we need to take a history lesson to go back in time a little bit. And one of the verses that I want us to look at first is from the book of Genesis. It says in Genesis 17.5, What's more, I am changing your name. It will no longer be Abram. Instead, you will be called Abraham, for you will be the father of many nations. The story goes back to Abraham because that's where God really started his plan. And and Steve and I were talking about this a little bit before church this morning about the fact that God has a plan. Go back to the idea of the fenced-in yard. God has a plan for you, and, and he will accomplish his plan. If you choose not to follow him, you may suffer some consequences from that. But God's plan will be done. And we could even go back further in Genesis to realize that God's plan from the very, very beginning, from the time that Adam uh, failed to be the leader that he was supposed to be and Eve ate that apple, from that very time when sin entered into the world, God's plan was to show us his love and bring us to reconciliation in him. That's God's plan in a nutshell. So what happened is throughout time after the flood, God comes to a guy named Abram. And he says, I'm changing your name, Abram, from Abram to Abraham because you're going to have a child. And Abraham had several children, two in particular. One was Ishmael, who is basically considered the father of the uh, Muslim nations, and one named Isaac, who's considered to be the father of the Jewish nation. And Isaac grew up, and Isaac had two children, one named Jacob and one named Esau. Jacob was the favored son, and he... um, had another child that some of you may remember the name of. His name was Joseph. Joseph was the second oldest, second youngest in the family. Joseph had the fancy coat of many colors. Joseph was a little bit of a snot, as younger kids can be sometimes, and made sure all of his older brothers knew that he had the blessing of God better than they did. And as siblings tend to do when you have the younger child being a little bit of a snot, they tend to find ways to get even. Joseph's Uh, brothers decided the best way to get even with him was to sell him into slavery to Egypt that would get rid of him. Didn't work out that way because God had another plan. And if you remember, Joseph went to Egypt and over a period of time eventually worked his way up to be second in command of Egypt. Egypt went through a period of seven years of tremendous crop growth. And it was Joseph's idea to take all those crops and and the government take them and store them because after that seven years of plenty, there would be seven years of drought. So during that seven years of drought, back up to Jacob and his kids up in the hills, Jacob heard that Egypt had food. And so he sent his kids to Egypt to get food. And guess who they ran into? Little brother Joseph had done all right for himself, hadn't he? They had to go to Joseph to get the food to get back to mom and dad, or to get back to dad. Joseph recognized his brothers. They were reconciled. And Joseph eventually welcomed all of his brothers, his family, uh, with the blessing of his pharaoh to Egypt, where they stayed and they they lived in uh, plenty. They lived a, a good life. And then Pharaoh died, and Joseph died. And over a period of 400 years, the Israelites became more and more numerous. But in the process of becoming more and more numerous, they became more and more a headache to the Pharaohs. And so finally, the, the Pharaohs, one of the Pharaohs decided to make them, instead of being citizens of Egypt, making them into slaves. In the process of all that slavery, as they cried out to God for deliverance, God brought somebody else into the picture. Little baby 
in a basket. Eventually, he'd never get adopted. You'd never be able to adopt that baby and put him in a basket. You'd have to have a fenced in yard, probably. Sorry, I'm a little bitter about the dog thing. Joseph grew up, instead of being a slave, he grew up to be the son of a king. He grew up having the possibility of being uh, one of the most powerful people in the world. And he blew it by committing murder. And he ran off to save his life and became a shepherd in the hills until God called him back and said, Guess what, Moses? Even though you're a terrible failure, you've been a failure as a leader, uh, you've been a failure in, in your walk with me, but you know what? I'm going to take you and I'm going to use you for something great. And so he said, Moses, you're going to go before Pharaoh and you're going to tell him that you want my people to be taken out of the country. If you remember the story from the Ten Commandments in the movie, if nothing else, you know that that was, a twi- cra- tw- was quite a struggle between Moses and Pharaoh, but it really wasn't a struggle between Moses and Pharaoh. This was a struggle between the gods of Egypt and the God of heaven. The gods of Egypt were... were Idols, they were, they were ideas, and if you kept them happy, they'd keep you happy. Completely different than the God of heaven. You see, the, and eventually the plagues were sent to destroy, every one of the plagues destroyed one of Israel, uh, Egypt's gods. Finally, Pharaoh let them go, but only after God sent an angel, a death angel, that would kill all of the firstborn. Fast forward a little bit farther, and we find out that Pharaoh and his entire army was killed. Let me tell you something about Pharaoh. Pharaoh didn't fail because he believed in other gods. Pharaoh failed because of something that each one of us has a problem with, and that is Pharaoh had a hardness of heart. Pharaoh refused to believe in the God of heaven. He refused to believe in what Moses tried to tell him. He demanded on having his own way. Something which, if we are really honest with ourselves, happens. See, it wasn't the plagues that did Pharaoh in, it was hardness of heart. Because hardness of heart, there's only one thing that I can think of that God cannot penetrate. We say God is all-powerful. We say God is almighty, he's strong, he created the world. I believe that God can do anything that he chooses to do, but there's one thing that is spiritual kryptonite to God, and that's a hard heart. That's a heart that says, go ahead, teach me. That's a heart that says, I'm going to do things my way. I don't care what you say. I don't care what your word says. I'm going to do things my way. Hardness of heart will keep God from working in our lives. And the picture of Moses and the picture of Pharaoh show the difference between the two. Moses felt completely inadequate in what he was doing. Moses was a complete failure. But Moses realized that if he followed what God said, he would be successful. Pharaoh, on the other hand, demanded that he stay with his tradition, demanded he stay with what was comfortable for him, and life was a failure for him. Fast forward to a mountain. The very mountain, by the way, where Moses was shepherding and he saw the strangest occurrence. He was on a mountain and off in the distance he saw a bush that was burning. But it wasn't consumed by flame. How does that work? And so on that mountain he went and that's when God challenged him and gave him the call of being his servant. Years later, or however long it was, I don't know how long it was, Moses returned there to go up on the mountain to meet with God, while down in the valley were a couple million people that he was going to be leading to the promised land. And God gave him the Ten Commandments. One of the things that you need to realize about the Ten Commandments is with so many things in the Bible, we have a hard time translating some of the things um, that the Bible says in the original languages into English. And it could be, according to scholars that I read, it could be that the absolute worst way to, to uh, translate the ten things that were given to Moses on that mountaintop was to call them commandments. That could be the worst way to translate that word because it wasn't commandments. It wasn't the kind of thing where God was standing up there saying, all right, do this and I'll love you. 
It wasn't saying, do this, these are the things you have to do to receive my blessing. It wasn't that at all. It was a loving father looking at his children that he loved dearly and saying, here, here are the things that I have for you. I love you. I delivered you from Egypt. You're mine. Now, do these things because they're good for you and will give you long and happy life in the long run. See, we see the Ten Commandments, and I've, I've heard, in fact, I've even bought into it occasionally, although I'm kind of changing that a little bit now. I've heard the whole thing of, well, the crime rate increased when we took the Ten Commandments out of the school. You know, this increased when they took the Ten Commandments out of public places. I think that the crime rate and the, the, uh, all that stuff increased not because we took the Ten Commandments out of schools, but because we took the Ten Commandments out of our heart. Because individually, we as a church started to buy into that whole idea that they were restrictive instead of... These are ten love notes. Ten love notes from God to us. Saying, I love you. These aren't restrictive. These are things that I know because I'm the all-wise God. I'm the all-knowing Father. These are things that I know will help you to grow strong in your life. It's not like with a rich young ruler. Remember that story in uh, uh, Luke? A rich young ruler comes to Jesus and he says, good teacher, what, are, what things do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, follow the commandments. And he said, I did all those. You know, I, I don't murder, I, I don't lie, I don't steal, I didn't beat my wife, I didn't do this, I didn't do that. And Jesus said, well, there's one more thing you need to do. You need to give away all the things that you have and follow me. Remember what the rich young ruler did? He dropped his head and he walked away. You know what was really happening in that story? Here was a guy that was not happy with his religion. He wasn't happy. He knew there was something missing between him and God. He thought there must be one more activity, one more thing that I need to add to my list of things that I do and don't so that I can be at peace with God. And Jesus was saying, it's not about doing things. It's about an attitude of heart. Another time Jesus was asked, Teacher, what are the greatest command what's the greatest commandment? They were trying to trap him. That's in the book of um, Mark. And and Jesus says, Here are the commandments. In the Old Testament law there were six we say there's the Ten Commandments, but in, in the Hebrew law there were really six hundred and thirteen rules for the of the uh, Hebrew law. We just know about these first ten, but there are there were rules about everything. And Jesus took all 600 and some of those rules and regulations and boiled them down to two things. Love God, love others. Those are really the two most important things. Love God, but do it with all of your heart. Do it with all of your energy. Put Him first place in all of your lives, in your relationships, in your financial dealings, in the way you treat your husband and wife, in the way you treat your kids, in the way you adopt your dogs. Now, all of those things, put God first. And the second thing is love others. And we know from the story of Jesus what that meant. So the first commandment, chapter 20, verse 2 and 3. God says this. He says, I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must not have any other God but me. Think about that first phrase that I've got highlighted in red. I am the Lord your God. Think about what that really means. The Egyptian gods, they didn't identify themselves. They didn't make it a personal thing. And he's not saying, I am all of our gods. He's saying, I am your God. I'm it. It's a personal thing that he's saying. You see, God wants desperately to make himself known to each of us. And not just known in the sense of, here you are at church, you're going to learn something new about God, but to be closely entwined with him, to know him better than you know yourself. That's what his desire is. And that's why he says, I'm the Lord your God. It's me, I'm the one. The second thing he says is, who rescued you from your, the land of Egypt and the place of your slavery. What a beautiful picture. You see, each of us 
are in bondage in some way or shape or form. Uh, as I mentioned last week, a lot of New Testament writers say, the thing that you put most of your energy and your action in, those are the things that you're enslaved to. Some of us are enslaved to relationship. And if we don't have relationship, life isn't worth living. Some of us are enslaved to money. We've got to have a good bank account. Some of us are enslaved to very good things like our children and our families. Some of us are enslaved to activities, to jobs. What do we spend our time thinking about? How much time do we spend thinking about who God is and the fact that he's there for us? He's the God that rescues. What's your Egypt this morning? Where are you trapped? What is it that's keeping you every day? You're thinking about the fact that you don't know how you're going to make it through this. That's your Egypt. And you have a God that's already delivered you from that. Why? Because you came to church Sunday morning? Because you've been confirmed, you did the baptism thing, you did all this other good stuff, you read the Bible every day and pray? No, those are all good things. But he rescued you because he loves you. He rescued a bunch of Israelites. If you ever do a study of the Israelites, by the way, and going back to Abraham and his family, if you ever want to read some juicy, um, dysfunctional family stories, go to Genesis and just read through it. There's deception, there's murder, there's adultery, there's group sex. There's all kinds of stuff in there. It's not a real pretty picture, but you know what? God took Abraham and his family as dysfunctional as they were. And you know what he brought out of that? A guy by the name of David, who also was dysfunctional. You know who he brought out of that? A woman by the name of Mary and a man by the name of Joseph that got together and had a baby Well, they didn't have a baby, but they raised a baby that was Jesus Christ. His plan succeeded regardless of how stubborn people were. But there were consequences along the way. God wants to make himself known to us because, in the last part of that verse, you must have no other gods before me. Exodus chapter 34, 14 says, You must worship no other gods for the Lord who's very name is jealous, is a God who is jealous about his relationship with you. Now let me a little paint, paint a little word picture for you. Let's just assume that Trish and I got married last night. And we went to the hotel and uh, we're there on our honeymoon and uh, we're together and we're just kind of getting ready to do what people on honeymoons do. And she stopped and she said, Honey, I love you, but before we go on, I just need to tell you something. Uh, What's that? Well, I don't want our marriage to be restrictive. And I've got some old boyfriends from college and and high school that I'd I'd like to keep seeing. Don't worry, I love you. You're still my number one. But I just want to do some dating. I don't want our marriage to be too restrictive in our lives. It shouldn't ruin our social life. After all, we live in a free society. We need to be more tolerant and open-minded. How do you think that's going to go? I can tell you how that's going to go. It ain't going to fly. When God says that he's jealous and he wants nobody else before us, he gives us a picture, even in this, of what marriage is. That's why in, in, uh, earlier in Genesis he says a man leaves his mother, a woman leaves his ho- the, her home, and they're joined together. And God says, I want you to be my bride. I want you to be my bride. I will promise you this. I will love you. I will never mistreat you. I will never cheat on you. But all I ask is that you love me in the same way. Now, is that restrictive? Is that intolerant? I don't think it is. Genesis 6, God is uh, looking down on planet Earth and he sees the people that have completely rebelled against him. And he says to a guy named Noah, I'm sorry I ever made the human race. But listen to why. And I have have to admit, I never saw, I don't remember having seen this before, but hear how the verse reads. It says this, So the Lord was sorry he ever made them and put them on earth because it broke his heart. 
Is that the story of an angry man that wants to retaliate? No. He looks at us, and you that are parents know this, especially you have children that are, that are grown and they've gone directions that you kind of wish they hadn't gone. Do you still love them? <laughs> yes. Do you wish sometimes you could take them and slap them silly? Yes. But will you ever, ever stop loving them? No. Wherever you are, whatever your Egypt is in, God loves you and wants to rescue you. That's what that message is. Just remember, he loves you. Remember this song? Some of you won't because it's too old. I thought of this and I thought this could be God talking when to us. probably the only church in the area playing Firefall this morning. Just a hunch. I was studying for this and I thought of that song and I looked at the words of it and I thought, wow. That's what God is saying to us. Just remember, I love you. Just remember, I love you when you're tempted to sin and you're struggling with whatever it is you're struggling with, remember, I love you. It's, it's like looking into the eyes of a loving father, not an angry father. I think I shared this story once before. One of the th times I remembered uh, one of the most effective disciplinary actions that my father ever took on me, and I grew up in the days of belts and sticks and other things. But one of the most important things that I remember is in our house we couldn't have playing cards. They were evil. I still haven't figured out why. And I snuck a deck of cards into the house 
to play, I know, solitaire. I know. <laughs> you probably don't even want me as your pastor anymore. And my dad came into the bedroom, and there I was caught, and I almost had won, with the cards spread out. And he came in, and I felt like I got slugged in the gut. His face fell. And he just said, it's time for me to take you into town for practice. That's all he said. Very quiet. And I went out and I got in the car and most of the way to school was very quiet. And then he said, almost as if I had snuck a woman or something evil into the room, where'd you get the cards, Mike? But you see, I realized at that point that I'd hurt my dad. But I also saw in those eyes not only hurt but love. When we're tempted to sin and when sin is a struggle to us, help, we need to realize he loves you. When you're feeling ashamed or, or embarrassed or you're wh horrified by something that you've done, just remember he loves you. And along with that love comes forgiveness. When you walk in circles, you're not sure what you're doing. You have what I call blonde moments. Sorry, Kay, you and I understand, right? And you just don't seem to get it. You know, the Israelites did that for 40 years. It took them 40 years to make a three-week trip across the wilderness. You know that? 40 years. Why? Because they couldn't figure out how to follow God. They couldn't figure out that he loved them. Those times when you feel aimless, you don't know where you're going, just remember he loves you. Just remember he loves you. So this morning as we close, who's your God? Who are you willing to sell out to? A bunch of gods that could be here tomorrow and gone, or could be here today and gone tomorrow? A bunch of gods that have failed over and over again? Or do you want somebody that has never failed once in his entire life, that has loved throughout eternity? What are you living for? Are you living for a bunch of activities and a bunch of things that you know are going to end, or are you going to live for something eternal? What can you live without? See, God loves us and he wants to set us free. And as I said at the beginning, freedom isn't about getting to do what we want. Freedom is about allowing God to help us to be everything we could possibly be. That's what freedom is, but it comes at a cost. And that cost is to follow what he says for us. Are we willing to do that? Let's stand together as we, as we uh, close. Father God, I thank you for your love for me. And uh, I just pray that as we go from this place, that uh, these, um, this, these verses that we've looked at this morning, uh, you are our God. You're a personal God. You're a loving God that is willing to rescue us. And I pray for anybody that might be in Egypt right now, whatever their Egypt is. I ask that you just encourage them to be able to turn to you and to be able to find in you the peace and the freedom that they have regardless of what other people have done to them, regardless of what they've done to themselves, regardless of the situation they find themselves in. Help them to see that they can be rescued from Egypt because of your love and your grace and your power. I pray against anybody or I pray for anybody that might be struggling with a hardened heart this morning that spiritual kryptonite that really keeps them from feeling the presence of your love. I pray that you would help them to be able to see your power in their lives, to be able to soften that heart and open it to you. Thank you, Father, for loving us, for loving each one of us, regardless of the situation we're in. And I pray this in your name. Amen.